Hebrews chapter 11 is the faith chapter. Now, I'm not going to break it all down. I'm just going to give you a quick verse of scripture, and we're going to launch into this thing. I have no idea which way it's going to go because, well, poor Sister Crow had to deal. God laid some stuff on my heart this morning, and I gave her a couple of shotgun blasts. I don't know. It was about 7 o'clock this morning. So, verse 6, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, that he is, he still is, <laughs> and he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. See y'all, some of you have replaced that word with casually. Oh. Yeah, this 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 may get rough before we land this plane today. <laughs> they going some y'all gonna feel some turbulence. Hallelujah, Amen. We're gonna shake some things loose. Maybe shake some junk out of your life. Uh huh. Some of you got too much junk in your trunk. Hallelujah. We had to open that thing, clean that. You're still playing trunk or treat, and it's well. Oh God, let's play, place your Bibles down. I'm gonna need that. Let's let's get let's get some help in here. Let's call let's call on God right now. Jesus, we need you. We come before you. Lord, we want a move of your presence and your power. We're not here to play church. Uh, we're here to be the church. Uh, we're here to allow you to move to work on our hearts, our minds, our lives, and save our souls and give us life and that more abundantly. We want all the cornucopia that Christ brings to us when we submit our ways to him. We thank you for it, Lord. We praise you for it. Anoint this service with your mighty presence. Interrupt it whenever you want. Move in and take over, Lord. We release this church to you, O oh God, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. You could be seated. I'm, I'm going to put a few more verses of scripture in your, in your heart and in your mind to get you thinking, to get you aware, mindful. Psalms 34, it says the Lord is nigh or close unto them better of a broken heart. Because we all like broken hearts, right, Sister Julia? No. And save as such as be of a contrite spirit. Now, I love y'all. but Not too many people walk around with a contrite spirit. Just ask them to move their seats. Let's sing a song different than what we had scheduled. <laughs> Here's an easy one for you to agree with. Let's let Brother Crow be pastor. <laughs> Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all. The afflictions of the righteous. Matthew 5 and 6, while Jesus is teaching on what, what we call the Beatitudes, he makes a statement in verse 6. And he emphasizes the word righteousness. I'm not always wanting to be Righteous. Sometimes I think I can do a better job than God. Well, in my mind, I know I can't, but in my actions, that's actually what I'm saying. That's why people struggle with faithfulness to church, faithfulness to prayer, faithfulness in giving. We, we give in a way we believe more in tomorrow than we do in God. That'll, that'll let that sink in. But he says, blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. 
Hunger and thirst both denote emptiness. The word filled qualifies the context. I, I, I want to put this next verse in there because a little bit later something's going to come up that I haven't fully got my Hebrew mind around. Uh, Isaiah 49 and 16 says, Behold, this is God getting very personal. I have ga graven thee upon the palms of my hands. Sister Grove got a little insight y'all don't have, so that's going to mean something to her. Thy walls are continually before me. What does that mean? What is, what is God doing with this hunger, thirst, and filled stuff? We're all wanting. We all fall, find ourselves short. I look around. There's water bottles everywhere. We don't have any anemic people with distended stomachs from starvation here. I'm pretty sure if you wanted to eat this morning, there was something. Because when you get up, there's this sensation of hunger that moves us. La <laughs> Sorry, babe. It's your fault. Last night, while my, it's, I'm sorry, it just fits in. And if it fits in and it's in my, it's coming out. So last night I, I'm studying and I went ahead and went into the bedroom, was studying the bed while my absolutely beautiful wife was there sleeping. She starts talking in her sleep. I won't go into all of it, but, but in the middle of some of that, she just started talking about water. She was thirsty. She wanted water. Enough to where she came to the service, the service, surface of, of coherency. And she said, hey, honey, you got any water? And I knew I had just enough. And I'll, I'll be playing here. Y'all need to. I'm a real person. I knew I had just enough. See, I, I know how to take care of me. I, I knew I know what I use every night. I don't go to bed without brushing my teeth. And I don't get into bed without having the glass of water that I need for that night and for the morning when I first wake up. I know, I'm taking care of me. Now, if you're an adult, I expect you to prepare to take care of you. So I'm there, and I got exactly what I like to have. I got a big old cup. It's about the size of a diesel truck tanker. It's just what I like. I don't like being thirsty. Okay? It's Arizona. It's a little dry here. It's dry heat. Anyway. <laughs> so she, she starts wanting water. So the first time she asked, do you have any water? Well, I told the truth. I didn't have any water for her, so I said no. What? Hold on. <laughs> Hold on. Hold on. I'm like, so we got this little dialogue. I said, and because of the way she was dreaming and talking, you, you probably need to get up and go into the kitchen and go. She needed to move around to get a reset. You know, it's one thing for my dog to get those dreams where it's twitching and running and it's sleep. And it's quite another when your wife's doing stuff like that. You know, just kind of hold on. <laughs> hold on. She calling people's names out. See, she got to say, you have a praying pastor's wife. She's a praying. She can, oh, she, if you only knew how much she loves and cares about y'all. She does. She, she, man, she's amazing. I'll be on. So she's there doing her spiritual calisthenics in her sleep. Then she comes service and wants water. I ain't got enough for her. But then I realized she's not going to go. And so she kind of drifts off and comes back again. Want water. I finally go, okay. So I give her and I let her, I let her drink my water because she was empty and she needed to be. Water creates a sensation. When you, when you deplete it, you need to get some, right? So everybody take a drink. If you got some water, take a drink of water. Praise God. We got an interactive church right now. Hallelujah. Needed water. Now, me drinking water didn't do you no good. You had to have your own water. That's right. That's right. Remember that. Anyway, as we move on. <laughs> yeah. She got the water. It says, calm down. Oh, Look like you want to hurt her, brother. Calm down. <laughs> now, listen. Listen, listen, listen. I, we're having a little fun, but I want us to get serious here. Galatians says, be not deceived. This is chapter 6, 7 through 10. God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth gives out. 
he shall also reap. Mm. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap, cor reap corruption. Look, don't get mad if all you get is worldliness in your life. That's what you're sowing to. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap ever, life everlasting. It goes on to say, and let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. No matter what you're going through, don't stop sowing good because you're always going to reap. You're always going to get what you're giving. Now, sadly, some of us are excited about that because you kept reaping to the flesh. You got a whole bunch of worldly things, but you're dry as dead men's bones. You're poor, naked, and have need of everything spiritual. As we therefore have opportunity, let's do good unto all men. I gave her the water, especially to them of the household of faith. We reap not according to our professions, but our practices. <laughs> you don't reap by what you want to get. You reap by what you actually give. So now in 2 Kings, there's a little story here in chapter 3, verses 16 to 18. And I'll cover this a little bit as we go. And he said, thus saith the Lord. We got three kings here. I'm going to give you their names in a minute. And they're, 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 they've joined forces. They're going to battle. And only one of them really is, 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 is seeking the face of God. But because of the, the, the group there, and I'll talk about them in a minute. He says, listen, listen, fellas. We got a situation here. We need to seek God. So they got a hold of the man of God. And this is the response that they got. Make this valley full of ditches. For thus saith the Lord, you shall not see wind, neither shall you see rain. Yet that valley shall be filled with water that ye may drink both ye and your cattle and your beasts. Did you hear that? There's going to be no sign of those ditches being filled, but dig anyway. There's going to be no sign that your need's going to be met, but do it anyway. And he goes on, and this is but a light thing in the sight of the Lord, and he will deliver the Moabites into your hand. So Jeroboam, the king of, not Jeroboam, Jerome Ham, king of Israel, had a little misprint there. And the king of Judah, Jehoshaphat, and the king of Edom went to fight against Moab. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Now Jehoram and his father Ahab were not in good standing with God. They didn't really wholeheartedly serve the Lord. They brought in some problems. And so when Elisha is approached because of the situation, they inquire of Elisha what they need to do. They had gathered their armies. They rushed off to fight, and they found themselves in a situation that they didn't have enough water. They had all these army men. They had all these horses and all this cattle. They're dying of thirst right before a fight. They're on the verge of a battle, and they can't, they can't even, they don't have anything to drink. They, they're in a dire situation, and this thirst, this, this feeling of needing or wanting was overpowering them. They were literally, like some of us spiritually, running on empty. They realized this is out of my hands. I'm in a situation here that I don't have what it takes to fix this. It's out of my hands. It's beyond my ability. Listen, we want, we, we want to handle and control everything. We want to think that we got to do everything. One of the greatest places that you could ever get to is that place. God, I may need all these situations, but I need you more. Because if I need you, if I get you, we got that. So Jehoshaphat said in, 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 in verse 11 of chapter 3, he said, Is there not a prophet of the Lord that we may inquire of the Lord by him? And one of the king of Israel's servants there said, Here is Elisha. This is the one that poured water on the hands of Elijah. So you know this old joker over here starting to realize, Oh man, you know, yeah, that's the kind of the one that had dealings with my daddy. Emptiness and thirst are powerful sensations. Go on a fast this week. Feel that. 
Learn that. Fast this week. Push away the plate until you get that feeling, I just got to have some need so bad. And say, I can't imagine how my spirit feels because I deny it the things of God. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting how Elijah speaks to them. He says in verse 14, and Elijah said, as the Lord of hosts liveth before, before whom I, I stand, surely were it not that I regard the presence of Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, I would not look toward thee and see thee. He's letting those other kings know, listen, I'm not even here for y'all. I'm here for the one that's acknowledged me. I'm in here for the one that reverences me. I, uh, I'm here because I got a God-fearing man in the midst and where two or three are gathered as a drink. They all knew they needed a drink, but thank God one of them had a connection. With you may not know how important your walk with God is to those around you. You better hear, get an email on this today. You don't know, don't give up believing in God because you're surrounded by those that won't believe. Don't give up trusting because you're in cohorts with those that aren't. God, God may still work something out because of your faith, your desire, your thirst, your hunger. But I do want to interject this. You can only treat God and his people bad for so long. Man of God got a little bit of an attitude here. I like that. It's okay when I get a little bit of an attitude. It's funny. People want to come in and demand people just do something in the church. Wait a minute. Get past kindergarten before you start asking me to do other things. Be faithful. Get the Holy Ghost. Pray through. Get some things. Be faithful. You know, you're not stepping on this platform. You're not getting behind an instrument. You're not doing stuff till you do the basic things. Wait a minute. I don't want you to start going. I, Aaron. Would your daddy give you the keys to his car? Does he love him? Yep. You're just not mature enough yet. He loves you the same, but he wouldn't want to give anything to you to hurt you until you've matured to handle it. Some of us lack spiritual maturity. Just because you come here, don't everybody has the right to sit there. But you got to live in the right way to be here. I didn't get here by being an idiot. I didn't get here by, by, by being an idiot and only living for God on Wednesdays and Sundays. Oh, man, I have a need. That's the great place to be. I need to live for him on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday. The man of God said, listen, I'm not here for you too, but for Jehoshaphat, he's lived for God. He, you, you, you better keep some godly friends in your life. So the situation in our text, many times we find ourselves in tough situations that are beyond our ability to fix. And everybody said, amen. You got a problem parent. You got a problem child. You got a problem job. You got a problem neighbor. You got a situation in your health. Uh, you got a situation in your finances. It's beyond you. And like these guys, you got no quick fix and they had no quick trip to go to. They could go there. Let me get in there and get me some Mountain Dew or let me get a water. They had no place to go. They could not rent, no matter how muscular and tough and how much soldiers he were, they could not pull a drop of water out of the heavens. They're thirsty, they're empty, and they have no means or way to satisfy a true need. And so a situation like this sort of causes a despair or even a resigning to a fate. Sadly, some of us live right there you become desperate, but not desperate enough to call on God. Can, can, can I get a, a believer in this to, to tell someone today, no matter who, I have a need. I have a need. I'm preaching and I have a need. I, I'm teaching this and I'm the one. I have a need today. I, I'm not here trying to tell you I got everything. I'm telling you, I don't have enough and I need more. I have a need here today. I came to deliver a message, but I have a need here today. When we finally seek the counsel of the Almighty, when, when they finally sought the Almighty, he tells them the very last thing any of us wants to hear. See, 
after seeking the will of God, these tired, thirsty, empty, frustrated men are told, dig ditches in a dry place. You got yourself there. Dig. It wasn't a suggestion. It was the way. Dig. When we get in bad situations, the last thing we want to do is wait on God in prayer. We want to run around and talk to this person and talk to that person and, and call this and try to manipulate the situation and try to get, try to get a, someone to help you get a job. And we're running around this and trying to get money from them and borrow from them and get from that and do this. I'll work an extra shift. I'll, I'll work later. But you won't go to God. We, just fix it, God. Right? Just fix it. Leave me out of it. And God, you're God, you just do it. We want God just to do it all for us, right? But God is moved by faith. God is moved by faith. That's how it works. God takes what you give and he blesses that. Your faith must be involved. You can't just omit faith. So while we're busy screaming, get me out of this. <laughs> I don't have time to get my heart right. I need relief now. Do it now, God. Where are you? Ah. Is, there, is, really, is there really anything worse than someone that has an attitude with God when he's not responsible for any of y'all's mess? You're asking me to pray. You're asking me to seek God's face at my, seek God's face at the worst moment in my life. God, that's as bad as Pastor Crow asking me to pray this week. Show up for prayer. Show up for the, I got things to do. All right. If you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you always got. If you want something more on God, you better sow in the spirit. Yeah. But sadly, we've been indoctrinated to the world's view of instant self-gratification. We like microwave food and microwave religion. Food with no effort and pain-free, popping a pill, blessings with no effort. Oh, just bless me, Lord. See you next week. Instant relief instantly. Here to ever hear the old, the old saying, Give a man a fish, you feed him for a day. Teach the man to fish, feed him for the rest of his life. But y'all, y'all got an understanding on that because we got that fishing thing down, right? All right. Mm-hmm. It's the same thing. Can I tell you, mommy and daddy's prayers are great, but they'll never replace the prayers you need to have. Sister Crow's prayers are great. And I'm telling you, I get to hear them. They're wonderful prayers. They're amazing, heartfelt, deep prayers. But I'm going to tell you something. You need to get your own. Mm, 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 mm. Hallelujah. The problem is, is we want to please ourselves. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And we want instant results without involvement. Wait a minute, God, I just need you to do it. But without faith, it's impossible. And we've been in ingrained with the world's mentality that if we don't see any personal gains or value, we won't do it. That's why virtue flowed on the woman who pressed through to touch Jesus. She did something nobody else was doing. While they all were brushing up against him, it was by accident. Hers was on purpose. That's why when she touched him, something happened. And when they touched him, nothing happened. There's, you could touch Jesus and nothing happened because you're just bumping into it. That's a message in it. That's why blind Bartimaeus received his sight and no other, no other beggar, blind beggar did. Anyone who presses through a problem to get to Jesus always gets more than those doing nothing. And those of you who think, well, God's done all he's going to do in my life and you're satisfied and fat and comfortable. Guess what? You're the one who stopped on the roadside and you may be blessed in the world's eyes, but God may look at you as poor, blind, and naked because you missed out on so much he could have done for you. Are you hearing me? Those seeking God always get more than those doing nothing. That's why ten, those 10 lepers that came to Jesus wanting to be healed, 
only one was made whole. Go look at that story. He was the only one who would worship like that. Who wait a minute? I just I'm not about to just walk away rejoice about what I got. I want to give something. And when he gave even more, he got more. It's sad. We live in a day and age where people can talk and gossip for hours about stupid stuff, but can barely spend 10 minutes in prayer talking to God about eternal things. Oh, we'll jump up and down and gossip and, and go and fool with this and fool with that and then turn around and we'll pray five minutes and you're done. That's like a religion that's void and vanilla, tasteless. It's, so, the text actually reveals the same human situation. They're told to put out a lot of effort. And where I'm having you put out effort, you're not going to see one reason why. I'm not going to show you a cloud. I'm not going to give you no water. There's going to be no storm hanging out. Uh-uh. You put out the effort. You give, and it shall be given. There's going to be no wind. There's going to be no rain. There's going to be no storm. There's going to be no way for those ditches that you're sweating and working to dig to be filled with water. Now that's hard to do. Telling me to dig when I can't see the potential. That's one of the hardest things for us to do. Work hard and put forth effort and we can't see why. You want to get your why? You'll be here this week. Mm -hmm. you'll be here before service starts. And you won't be busy. And those of you, and so I'm not just going to pass here for a minute. You got things to do, then get here earlier so you still get the same amount of prayer time in. Are you hearing what I'm saying? It's hard for us to give to something when we can't see a return. That's why, I, why a lot of relationships break down. One person's all in and the other person's, uh. So we want to understand the practicality of a task. If it's not going to rain, I'm not digging no ditch. What? If it's not going to rain, I'm not going to dig a ditch. If I, I can't see any signs of rain, why dig it? If I can't see, why, 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 why would I pray? If I can't understand what's going on, why would I go to church? If I don't see any reason, why would I be faithful? And it is this this moment, this God concept that brings us to the very place of obedience to God that proves our allegiance, our heart and our faith and what it trusts in. None of us has a problem going around and spending a lot of time on either fishing or working on whatever task it is that you like because the reward is in of itself. And that's why God in America is shoved. That's why they wanted to, they want to, put on the Supreme Court, this young lady believed in God and all they want to do is run her down because she biblically believed, I got a husband, he's the head of the house. Man, how few ladies would love to have a man that be the head of your house. Open the doors for you and take out the trash, treat you like a queen, yet you got all them Jezebel spirit people. Oh, there's something wrong with that. Are you out of your mind? I don't want a woman to be married to a woman that's in competition with being a man. And she don't want to be married to some Joker that's being in competition of being a woman. <laughs> God is looking to prove our allegiance to him. That's why we got to straighten our minds right. We got to wait a minute. The world will tell you this is okay, that's okay. Let me tell you when we'll get my thought processes out of the word of God. I don't care what the what what, what the, the law says. I don't care. It may be legal for me to drink. I'm not drinking. It may be legal to smoke marijuana. I'm not doing it. I'm not going to. I answer to something separate because I want something different. God is proving our followership, our faith, our belief system. That's why he says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it, by it, the elders obtained a good report. 
If you were to read that story in the, in the, in the second uh, book of Kings in chapter 3, in the very next chapter 4, there are two incidents of stories that have a common thread that shows how God separates and checks our motives. He separates people out. First of all, in 1 Thessalonians 2 and 4, that as we are allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel. Listen, Paul's speaking here. He's given us an understanding of being trusted with the things of God. Even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God, which trieth our heart. I'm just going to say this, and I'll, we all been through stuff. And there will be somebody who went through way more than you, who still lived for God. Because him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him is sin, and the wages of sin is death. You will not stand before God, well, so-and-so did, did this to me, and say, well, I was crucified, but I still died for you. There'll be no excuse. Okay, now we're fixing it. We're fixing it again in my message. Now, okay, ready? If you follow in the next verse, in the next chapter, there was a woman with a dead husband. The creditors were coming. They were going to take her two sons, and all she had was a pot of oil. Then after that, there's a Shunammite woman with an empty womb. And she built an addition. One had emptiness. And one created an empty place. This is, this is bigger than that. They both had empty places. One empty place was created by death. And the other empty place was created by choice. In other words, let me tell you something. No matter how you got here today, no matter how your need was created, whether it's by a situation or you are here building up, God, I just want more. God will fill it if you give it to him. Empty vessels, empty wombs, and God, it doesn't matter. He fills the empty place. He fills needs and deficiencies in our lives. Those places that make us frustrated and angry and get to that place where, where we don't know what to do. You have to understand. You have to, you have to realize, are you going to allow it to frustrate you? Or inspire your faith. This is what separates saints from ain'ts. It's your choice how you handle it. A boat rises and sinks depend on where it keeps the water. A rising tide can elevate you or sink you. It's what you do with the situation. Every one of these situations mentioned bring the element of doubt or fear or effort and faith. You want to find out what you are? Look at what you're doing Monday. Look at what you're doing Tuesday. You're going through. We're all going through something. Life, man, is a few days and full of trouble. You're going to have situations. But are you going to handle it with doubt and fear or effort and faith? You choose. You choose. So that same mental background we find ourselves in when we're told to. How many is going through something? Teach a Bible study anyway. How many's got weights on your shoulders? Pray faithfully anyway. How many's got a lot on your plate? Be faithful to the house of God anyway. What are you doing? I'm choosing effort and faith over doubt and fear. I'm choosing. Choose you this day whom you're going to serve. Choose. It's that simple. It's not complicated. It's not difficult. You don't have to manipulate. It's that simple. It's as simple. Either you're going to dig ditches or you're not. But I don't see a cloud. I don't care. He told me to dig. I say I'm going to do it. I'm going to dig. I'm going to be faithful. I'm going to pray. I'm going to be a church. I'm going to sing. I'm going to worship. I'm going to clap. I'm going to do what I'm going to sow. It's that place in our hearts that decides whether we're going to be practicers or just professors. Do we just talk or is there some action? Will we react in faith or frustration at our situation? In fact, in this same book in chapter 6, 
there's a man by the name of Naaman who's given a task because he's a leper of dipping seven times in the Jordan River. He gets enraged. There's the answer you want. This is what you got to do. And he gets mad. Look, we have a problem. We're human. And Brother Davenport, I don't care how we like to act humble, we're prideful. We have an opulent pride in America that has allowed this country to get in the condition it's in. The moment we're going to tell the creator, whether we're male or female, we got some pride. The moment we tell the creator, I'll pray when I, when I, when I have to come. I don't have to be faithful to church. Any, hello? We want to turn the word of God into and make it evil. There's something wrong with humanity the moment it's going to, the creature is going to tell the creator, this is how we're going to do it. Y'all seen it in the kid? Turn around and act up, mama. You ain't going to tell me what to, at some point, hey, this is going to hurt. At some point, you got to say, you know what? I love you, but I can't save you. At some point, you're going to have to start doing right for yourself. At some point, you're just going to have to realize this. that's not what I want for you. I'm older than you. I can see farther than you, but you refuse to allow me to help you. Go do your thing. Go do it. Hey, I've been there. I've done that. It hurts. But the Bible even says, you've got to have to, the Bible even says, give them over to Satan that they might be saved. You just got to let them have, go about their way. And so here's Naaman. He's been told what to do, but he's enraged. He's angry. He's mad. He couldn't see why it had to be that way. It was beyond his understanding. He's mad. He's about to stomp off. And one, and, and one of the servants said, hey, wait, wait, wait a minute. If, if, if he'd asked you to do some great thing. And, 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 and they was like, well, wait, what about, what about Abana and Farfar? What about these better places? God doesn't want it you to do it your way. He wants you to do it his way. Any parent ever said, because I said so? Man, you and me both, sister, I, because I, why is it that we can say, because I said so, but God can't? So you know what he did? Got a servant gave him a servant told a captain, dude. Let me just paraphrase this. McFly, just just do what you are. It's the simple path, just do what you're asked. Yeah. You have a need. Here's the answer. Why are you fighting with it? Yeah. Just do it. So he went down <laughs> into the Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God. And his flesh came again like in the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. At the beginning, Naaman couldn't see the value of the symbol. He wanted to insert what he valued in the equation. He wanted what his mind could see, what his values thought, what he could think. And I'm going to tell you right now, it wasn't the river that healed him. It wasn't the water in there that healed him or else every leper around would have went running. It was his obedience. But we don't like that word today. You ain't telling me what to do. God's like, okay, <laughs> go on with your bad crippled self. Go on with your need. Go on with a messed up. Go ahead with a messed up head wanting to hurt yourself. Where'd you get those ideas from? You didn't get them from God. Why are you having fellowship with all this messed up ideology? It's destroying you. God, it's just this simple. And you can have life and that more abundantly. His, his obedience, that, that dreadful yet beautiful word. You see, we think on a different economy than God. Let me get into this. In our minds, the resources available have to match the need at hand. My eyes have to see how. <laughs> my eyes, you know, you, my I, I have to see how this is going to work. Uh -uh. God 
God sees differently. He thinks differently. God likes to do great things with the somewhat insignificant. See, we see 5,000 hungry people and we want to send them away to get fed. Let somebody else put out the effort. Jesus, send them away. Send them away to go eat. Jesus said, oh, no, hold up. Well, there's a little lad here. Oh, see, this, this is going to mean something in a minute. There's a lad here with a giving heart. There's a lad here teaching the elders. Y'all just a bunch of, you're following Jesus, but you ain't listening. Willing to give his less 5,000 people. And here's his kids and I'll give my lunch. What is Jesus saying? He is looking for those willing to step out with what little they have and letting God do a miracle. Giving God your insignificant leads to the magnificent. I want you to watch. I'm going to get into something here. I'm just going to give you a taste of it, and we're going to get it in a minute. Moses delivered Israel, and he used a stick. That's all he had. It's what Moses had in his hands. But something happened in Exodus 4 and 2, and the Lord said to him, what is in thine hand? And he said, a rod. Everybody say, big what? Got a stick. The rod was first in Moses' hand. But then the Lord gave him some instructions to do. And, and so he said, throw down thy rod. He threw down the rod. Then it turned into a, come on, man. We got some Bible people in here. He said, take it up in your hand by the tail. An ordinary stick became a powerful rod. Remember this, we're going to get back to this in a minute. Everybody say, remember that. So in our Bible, in your Bible. All we see in this situation today is an overwhelming army of thousands that's going to destroy us. You ever felt that? Overwhelming. I got so much again. I got a spouse problem, children problem, money problem, health problem. I got all these problems. I got all this against me. So many times throughout scripture we see this. Uh, there's all this army against Israel. And God says, give me Gideon, 300 dudes, and we're going to go handle this business. We see a giant with an arm, with armor and a giant spear with a bad attitude and bad breath and he's too big to fight. God said, give me a little David with a slingshot and we got this. We see a tomb with a dead man. He's decaying. In fact, everybody said, he's going to stink already. Don't touch it, Jesus. And God says, watch this. See, we don't look at things like God does. We don't handle things like he does. We don't. God can work in whatever situation you have if you'll give it to him. I get it. It feels hopeless in our eyes. Beyond our fixability, every circumstance was a situation of great need. Anybody got a supernatural need? You can't see how. But let me tell you, as long as you're self-sufficient and you want to do it your way, God's a gentleman. say, okay, go on with your bad self. If you don't want to seek him, then you don't get supernatural intervention. There was a man in 1 Samuel. He had two wives. One was Hannah and the other's name was Penina. Penina had children, but Hannah, Hannah was barren. She had no children, the Bible says in, in verse 2 of Samuel chapter 1. And her husband was a, was a godly man. They went up and they worshiped God and did all this, but, but something was going on in the home. Hannah had an adversary in her home. This Penina, he said, oh yeah, that, come on kids. What's up, old barren chick? Come on, man. I, you, he's all happy because I'm giving him sons and you're, you're as dry as toast. You ain't doing nothing for him. Provoked her. Sometimes you need the enemy to provoke you a little bit. So, you know, I'm going to tell you something. God may allow a situation to come into your life because he's wanting to get your attention. you got to get sick of being sick. you got to get sick of the struggle. you got to get mad at watching someone else being black. you got to get sick of that. you got to get sick and tired of someone else getting anointed to preach. You ought to get sick and tired of someone else getting there teaching youth and teaching Bible study and teaching Sunday school and God working. You ought to get, I want to do that. 
that adversary provoked her. And her husband, being a good guy, said, hey, why are you crying? Am I not better than you than 10 sons? Oh, man, excuse my French, but slap a fool. Are you kidding me? She's wanting her whole livelihood as a wife and a woman was the ability to be fruitful. The provision of men is not going to satisfy her. I want the supernatural provision of Almighty God. I, I love you, honey, but I want something from God. I need something. I'm in a situation. I'm in a strait. I'm in a circumstance. I got something going on. The world can't satisfy. Money can't satisfy. Nothing will satisfy. I need a supernatural move of God. So you know what she did? She belly ached about it. Nope. She went and, date, went and got her nails and hair done. That, that, nope. She went to the mall and, and, and blew a thousand bucks on it. Nope. The Bible says she prayed. Kind of like them go, she digging ditches. I don't see how. I don't know how you're going to do it, God. But in faith, uh, but in faith, I'm going to I'm, I'm going to create a vacuum. I'm going to create a place that I, I'm not going to get frustrated. I'm going to handle it in faith. I'm going to believe God for my miracle. Listen, if you can be satisfied with the natural, you can have all of it. And when you get satisfied with the natural, you'll stop reaching for the supernatural. You have to understand, you'll, some of us have been blessed by God. The enemy said, I'm going to let them have that. I get them, I'll get them off the field. They'll stop praying and fasting and preaching and teaching and loving. They'll be satisfied with the things of the world. They'll omit the kingdom of God. And you'll no longer reach for the supernatural. If you value the flesh, you'll sow to the flesh and you'll reap the flesh. But God is looking for those that want a supernatural walk with him. Now I get it. There are some of you... I don't see why I don't see any rain. I don't see, why would I dig ditches? Why am I going to show up to that church on a day off? Why am I going to show up and be faithful? Why am I going to be there at prayer time? Why am I going to get involved? Why would I do that? Why, why, and you're, why, why? And you're so busy with the whys that you miss the wonder. But those faithful people, those believers, uh, they don't care that there's no crime. They don't care that there's no clouds. They don't care that there's no storm and no rain. They start digging because it's what God said to do. Like Naaman, it's what God said to do. You're not looking for the carnal. You're pursuing the supernatural. Do you know that if you read that story, God filled every ditch they dug. God filled every ditch they dug. He filled every empty vessel the woman in the next chapter brought. Every vessel they got in house, he filled. He fed the entire multitude with a lad's lunch. And they even had leftovers. You may not, a believer doesn't have to see how. He just has to just obey. He's just going to be obedient. He's going to keep digging. He's going to keep praying. He's going to keep fasting. He's going to keep believing. Listen, the whole reason for the story of those three kings, they were famishing for want of water. And here was the case of human helplessness. We don't like that. We like to, we dress up for church like we don't need anything. What do we call it? Our Sunday. Make sure the car's washed and everything's perfect because we want to present that image. When deep down, I got a need. I got, I got some situations that are keeping me up at night, plaguing my mind. I got a situation that's beyond my resources. I've got pain beyond what a pill can fix. I, I, got, I got empty places. I got, I got hurts and I got wounds and life hasn't come like I thought it would. 
And these men couldn't make it rain. They were in an unfixable situation. It was beyond their abilities and it led and showed them the place of helplessness. Can I tell you, often it's only when the people of God are at their wits end that we learn where our help is to be found. Do you know that wits end is in the Bible? Wits literally means wisdom, your wisdom's end. God wants to get you beyond you. I don't understand this. I don't know how this is going to work. God's finally got you where you're supposed to be. How could he be God if you understood everything about him? I still think, even though y'all amend it, you really think he could be God if you, if you and I could understand everything about him? Man, you, you think too highly of yourself. Let's start, let's have a little conversation about quantum physics. Everybody leave. Yeah. He invented it. <laughs> Some of us, the place God's been trying to get you is beyond you. Psalms 107, it says in verse 27 through 32, they reel to and fro and stagger like a drunken man, like, like not as, and are at their wits end. Then, then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble and he bringeth them out of their distresses. He maketh the storm a calm so that the waves thereof are still. Then are they glad because they be quiet. So he bringeth them unto their desired haven. He brings you to the place when you finally get to your wit's end, he can get you to your desired haven, your desired place. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children. Can you imagine if we would just praise God around here? Can you imagine as a saint of God that come tomorrow in the middle of the nasty now and now and all hell's breaking loose? I'm gonna praise God anyway. I'm gonna, it's beyond me. I don't know how, but that's okay. He does. I don't know how it's gonna work out. I don't know how it's going to end, but he does. I'll praise him. I'll exalt him. I'll be faithful to him. I'll be obedient to him. Well, we got about six or seven here that are believers. And all the elders can be seated. Elder is not something by age, it's maturity and spiritual. To use a stood up, that's maturity. Let them exalt him also in the congregation of the people. If you're a believer, you're going to exalt him. What you just did was exalt him in the congregation. Now all those that are struggling and sitting there like, uh, uh, it's beyond me, I don't understand it. Good. But my body's tired. But my body's... That's okay. You'll fool around with all that other junk all day long, all week long. Surely God's worthy of a little extra. It don't make sense. It don't have to make sense. I'm doing it for him, not for me. And praise him. In the assembly of the elders. Can I tell you? We have access to the answer. We have access to the very answer. That are, is beyond our wisdom. God is right there. Available. Oh that you give him honor. Oh that you give him praise. You want to know why you, this world is in turmoil? You want to know why it's at odds with itself? And why we're divided? Because we're too wise to seek God. Americans are too enlightened to seek God. You know why you can sit there and you've been around church for a while and there's a move of God and you can sit there? You're too enlightened. Now let me qualify this. See, because I know my body hurts. But when I find myself on a Monday or Tuesday or Thursday rolling around underneath the car, all kind, 
I'm not about to do more on that than I am in here. I, I, I can go out there in front of my wife and do something that's stringers. But then, I still got it. Are you hearing me? First Corinthians gives, Paul gives us, he says, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. If you're too wise, God's going to destroy some things in your life. Your very fears will come upon you. And I will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is prudent? Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. Too many of us have got the wisdom of the world and we just come in here to appease God instead of please God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Our mentality towards God has a direct effect on the outcome of our dilemmas. It is in this place where we must step out in an obedient, believing manner for divine blessings. Dig ditches. Dig ditches. Yeah. Because the thing you want, it's got to go into a container. You want to be filled with the Holy Ghost? Give them an empty container. Let me tell you one of the biggest things about preaching. It's prayer. You pray yourself empty so that God can fill you. Because if you didn't do that, you get up here and you just talk and the colloquialisms you've used for a hundred years and your attitude and your thoughts instead of the word of God and anointing will come. So the, one of the first orders of of preaching and, and, and being a good Bible study is study teacher, pray yourself empty and let God fill you up. Yes, 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 yes. I know that. I know. It's not about, hey, I got this material. I want to get up there and teach. Come on. Come on. Let me see you go through an empty phase and God fills you and transforms you and changes you. And it's undeniable. The anointing's on them. The Holy, Look at them worship. Look at them shout. Look at them reach people. Look at them turn the world upside down. So can I, can I, can I let, me, let, me, let me take a little evangelistical license because I know I need to bring this to a close. Create an empty place. Emphasize the need. Isn't that what Hannah did? Look, look, I love you, honey, but no, you are not better than 10 sons. In fact, you aren't better than one. Accentuate the need, church. Jesus did this. I want you to watch carefully here. Are you ready? Would you listen up? In Luke chapter 9, verse 14, something happens here, and, and you miss it if you don't study it. Here's the situation. We've got all these hungry people. Can you imagine? Let's just imagine. Even this group this size. Everybody's hungry. And I got five loaves of bread and a couple of fish. So I would send them away. And he said, for there are about 5,000 men. And he said to his disciples, make them sit down. Everybody say down by 50s in a company. Sit down. Now that's just not the simple word of sitting down. In fact, uh, the, the, the translation is kat, kat ak lino. Kat ak lino. The phrase literally means to take, take a place at a table. Literally means to sit down to eat. That's not revelatory until you realize what the disciple says. Because now, I don't know about you, but you don't ask 5,000 hungry people to sit down and be ready to eat unless you got some provisions or plans. So Jesus tells the disciples, you make them sit down in the context of get ready to eat. And you stand, wait a minute. I got some Wonder Bread and some fish sticks, and you want me to tell 5,000 people to sit there? That ain't even enough for Eric, and never mind everybody else in this place. 
Oh, I'm telling you. Uh-uh. That barbecue sauce she throw down there, nothing left for me. Now, all they had was this little lunch. But listen, that's not all they had. There is a who involved here. You thought Horton here to who. You wait, you see, the, the, the disciples had a who. So much like digging these ditches, there was a need to be filled. 5,000 needs plus women and children. Are you hearing me? So Jesus said, make the hungry that need to be filled sit down because it's time to eat. As I looked a little further, it literally meant get ready for a party. It really did. I was like, are you out of your mind? I'm reading this and I, I'm getting in and out of my ridiculous chair that's falling apart going by myself. Going, what do you mean? Jesus got a sack lunch and he's still ready to throw a party, brother Lord. He's still, wait a minute. He's got these joker disciples. He's trying to, McFly, get a clue. Sit him down. And he used the word they understood. Get ready to eat. Get ready to eat. Now, just so we all don't feel like a bunch of rank sinners, let's look at what the disciples did because the words Jesus used and the words the disciples used were not the same. Because when the disciples gathered and told him to sit down, they used the same word with something missing. Now, you have to understand, and I'm not going to tell you I understand all the Hebrew and Greek, but the Hebrews, they read from this way to this way. Their alphabet is different. They used, there is a K in front of that anaacalino. So there's a <laughs> Sister Crow got up this morning and I'm sitting there listening to this rabbi teaching the Hebrew alphabet. Babe, what are you doing? You wait till you see what's going on here. <laughs> you shouldn't have asked because I gave her both barrels. See, see, see the words that Jesus used and the word that the disciples used were not the same. When the disciples said it, they left off the letter K. Yeah. K is emphasized when you see the letter K, it's either like this or like this or like this with a dot in it. I'm not gonna go no deeper than that because it gets complicated and I'm not Hebrew. <laughs> okay, listen. The K, it adds an element of submission to it. I'm submitting to another one's will. You're like, okay, big whoop. Now, remember when I told you to remember what Moses did? In Exodus chapter 4, verses 2 through 4, the same thing happens. And the Lord said unto him, what is that in thy hand? And that's yud. Yud, what's in your hand? Yud. That's just your hand. Okay. And he said a rod. And he said, cast it upon the ground. And he cast it upon the ground and it became a sermon. And Moses, he fled. Oh God. And the Lord said to Moses, hey, wait a minute. Chicken lips, get back over here. He said, put forth thine hand. Yud. And take it by the tail. And he put forth his hand, Yud, and caught it, and it became a rod in his hand. But that hand changed. It went from Yud to Chad. There was an element of submission in it, and his submission empowered it. Oh, because before it was Moses's, it was just Moses's, it was a yud. But the moment it had gone from God's hand, now it became chud. It was powerful. It was powerful. It it wasn't a stick. It was a rod. It was the it was a representation that he was now submitted to God, and that whatever I give. It's going to come back blessed. It's going to come back blessed. It's going to come back powerful. Moses' submission. The lad's submission. The disciple's submission. All of a sudden, that little sack lunch became like that rod. 
powerful. It became powerful. That'll be the need create. Oh, God. That need, wait a minute, God. Let me take my insufficiency and give it to God and come back. Oh, and feed thousands and be miracles and do great things. In God's hands, it's powerful. The lunch in the lad's hands was just the lunch. The lunch in the disciples' hands was just the lunch. But the lunch in the chad of Jesus, it fed 5,000. In God's hands, it's powerful. You can't touch it. I don't care how bleak it looked. I don't care how bad it looked. When you submit your need in the hands of God, the miraculous, the yard turns to God. Yeah, it's powerful now. Now listen. I know I need to finish my Bible study, but you have to understand the yard is the hand. The God literally denotes the palm. Let's all stand. I'm just, I'm not going to, I got a whole bunch more to go through, but I'm not going to do it. I'm going to give you this and, and we're going to end it. I hope this helps somebody today. I read, I read a verse to you in the beginning. I just interjected it there. And the reason I can't go deeper is because in all honesty, there's more here than I can unravel today. Because we know there's a yud and there's a chad. And the reason some of us are, you know, Kiana, I didn't get here on flowery pathways of ease. I was a mess. Brother Lawrence, I can't even tell you. In fact, in all honesty, the other day I was told my, one of my sisters was watching my message. Oh, man, what's going on with Steve? I've been doing this for over 30 years. Where have you been? See, sometimes people keep you where you used to be. They don't understand. I'm no longer in my yud. I'm in God's God. See, see, brother Carl. To me and you, I'm just Stephen. You're just Carl. We come to church and we treat one another like. But see, in the hands of God, you're not Carl. Because you're not in your hand. You're in his hands. And that changed you from good to a God. Submission, powerless. I know this isn't for everybody. I wish it was. And I, I wish this altar would be filled with people saying, God, I want to be in your hands. How many know? How many know that God loves you with an everlasting love? Yes. Now, how many are honest that a lot of times we struggle with giving ourselves to his love? We've been burned. We've been hurt. We've been done wrong. And so it's hard to come to a church, be faithful, pay tithes and offer and teach, but become the full-fledged Christian because we're so afraid we're going to be hurt. So we, we fear placing ourselves in the hands of God. Jesus saw this. And he even made away in this. Behold. I'm so thankful for this. I have graven thee. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Upon the palms of my hands. In thy walls, your struggles, your problems. Are before me, but you're never going to leave my hand. No one can pluck you out of my hand. No one can pluck you out of my hand. I got you. I got you. I won't let you go. No matter the pain, no matter the struggle, no matter the situation. I got your answer. I am your answer. 
Brother Corey, come here. I got you. I got you. I'll protect you. God loves you just like that. Now, 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 listen to me. If he wants to throw me off and do it his own way, go ahead. But you'll hear me if I've ever prayed with you, heard me say, you can take a thousand steps away. But if you want the cut back, you got to go where? Come back. Got you. I got you. I got you. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I've got you. I've got you in the palm of my hand. I won't let you go. I'm not going to let you go. Jesus, the, the world will spit you out. The world will toss you around. It'll betray you. It'll hurt you. But Jesus loves you so much that he's engraving you on the power or the palm, the strength of his mighty hand. He is faithful and just to forgive.